I guess the question I have, and this may be more for Bruce than for you, I don't know, but it's more of a policy question. At this point, we are uh, waiting on a constitutional amendment to go in front of the voters on whether there's going to be support to uh, have public funding go to a to private um, education in part for this early learning effort. And until we have a uh, decision by the voters on whether to go forward with that type of arrangement or not, you know, we don't know what we're going to be setting up, if anything. So the question I have is, you know, can you explain why you're bringing forward this amount of requests? Because I know last year we funded enough to be able to provide the preschool open doors for the children who would have been eligible for kindergarten uh, under the old, the former age that we have for kindergarten readiness. Um, why is the administration bringing this forward at this point before we have a determination by the voters on the constitutional amendment? Sure. Um, there's a few things there. One is um, the, the preschool open doors funding, which is wonderful, and thank you all for your actions there. But it only funds a fraction of the children who are no longer eligible because of the change in kindergarten entry age. So part of our concern is really how do we meet the needs of more children and really help get them prepared for kindergarten. So we know that the Constitution Amendment will allow us to work with private institutions if it passes. But there's also other options that we have available, such as working with DOE or working on enhancing family engagement. So we're really just increasing the different kind of mechanisms or the funding mechanisms to be able to support programs. I guess the question I have really is, you would build a program in one way if this amendment passes. You would build it probably a different way if the amendment doesn't pass to do some efforts, you know, to build something this year which may not be either one of those models. You know, then does that get undone? Does that get added on next year after we have a determination or what? And that's why, you know, um, isn't it premature to be bringing forward this size of an initiative around early childhood education before we get a read from the voters? Not at all. I really think that the, what we're asking the voters is whether or not public funds can go to private institutions. To me, this is a separate issue. We're really looking at how do we get children prepared for kindergarten? How do we increase access to preschool programs? So creating a public school option is something that I don't think will go away. I think it's a way that we can enhance it. We are working, we're meeting, I'm meeting with HSTA next week. We really want to make this a program that's a solid program for our state. But it, I don't think it can be the end all and just the only option. So we really need to look at what are some other funding mechanisms that we can do to create capacity and to allow access for children to attend quality programs. Thank you, Representative Ward. You're following uh, Senator Thielen's uh, point and the seeking of a consensus getting the permission of the, of the voters. Uh, what about the consensus with the teachers? Are you making any headway on that? Is, is that, that that's a big part of this equation. Uh, do you have a response to what has been circulated so far? With which teachers? The HSDA. Teachers. The teachers. Yes, we have. Um, we actually are working closely into in alignment with what HSTA is recommending, which is hiring HSTA teachers and HGEA educational assistants to offer a quality preschool program. Where we differ is that in terms of kind of going out long term, is it the most economical way to be able to expand the program? And I'm not sure going 100% DOE way is the way to go. So the private funding or the public funding of private schools is still a sticking point then? I'm not sure I actually will meet with them and talk to them about it, but really that to me is a separate issue. The first issue is how do we get more children access to a quality preschool education? So I think our budget request is rather modest in that we're only looking at funding 32 classrooms in which we would offer 640 children that opportunity to really get prepared for kindergarten. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, any other questions? Wait, hold on. Representative Kobayashi. How did you pick 32 schools and uh, why would 32 schools merit 
any consideration over I don't know how many others. Uh, what would we have? Uh, what would we have? We would have a uh, hundred and fifty plus elementary schools easily. There's a lot of factors that went into this. Um, I've been meeting with DOE regularly to kind of figure out what is the number that we can realistically build a solid infrastructure. We just want to throw a bunch of money and just hope something happens, but really build a quality program. To me, 32 is a reasonable number where we can really start with really building upon what we know about quality education, really working with principals, working with the complex area superintendents, working with our professional development experts in early childhood, really building a solid infrastructure. I can see the program growing if we can start it really well, really make a solid program, really see what we need to do to make it the most effective to lead to the child outcomes that we want to see. Um, in terms of the 32 schools, though, we really looked at what schools are Title I schools that have the children with the greatest need? What schools are the schools that are don't have preschools available to them, such as in KKP, for example? There are not any preschools. There are very limited in number of preschools. So we looked at rural settings. We looked at where is principal interest? Where is there space in school? So we really went through a lot of criteria to come up with a list that makes sense to us. So 32 seems like a number that we could do really well. So, um, I'm sorry, your reasonableness is based on a large number, uh, at least several factors. Um, was there any primary factor that went into picking 32, 32 schools? I, I don't quite understand. Uh, you said reasonable. Um, to me, any number is reasonable. Um, 10 schools, 50 schools, uh, but you picked 32. I'm not sure why. I, I mean, is this considered aggressive or non-aggressive expansion? I think it's non-aggressive. I think it, um, to me, 32 schools, having been a run programs before, running 32 classrooms is a reasonable number for a large, kind of in a large, in an urban type area, between urban and rural. We want to really, I, I think 32 is a reasonable number. It allows us to really be able to have the oversight that we want to see. I've monitored programs in previous positions, and to me, 32 is a reasonable number. If we can't monitor those programs and ensure quality, we're not going to be effective. So we want to make sure we have enough infrastructure, but not too much infrastructure. We don't want to keep adding on positions to EOEL, but really create a position where we can help build infrastructure within DOE and the existing structure. So to me, 32 seemed like a number in which we could work with as many complex areas as possible, but not so everyone kind of gets a share to have us one or two classrooms and really build up a solid program. You're welcome. Okay, thank you. Representative Jordan. Right. Sorry. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, going on that line of question, my schools, pretty much all Title I schools, my schools have no more room for expansion. So I'm going to give up a regular classroom setting for a pre-classroom setting. My thought process with this was working with the outside agencies on building that pre-program. Um, I don't see how you're going to be able to place any of those new classrooms on any of my elementary schools because we don't have the space. Um, my biggest question was in the lines of Senator Thielen's questioning, the 5.4 million that they're requesting, my thought is why are you not asking it through DHS, through the Open Doors program? Because definitely this is a pre-program and I think it still fits within the needs of the, that, that program we have through DHS. I think the legislature was gracious, gracious enough to move forward with a, a system that was already set up. And I, I would have loved to have seen you coming in and asking during that, de that department to continue that train thought, why we wait for the constitutional amendment through 2014 election. Those are some of my questions with the positions you were adding. So that, that's, that's, that's where my thoughts are going with this program. And I do have some challenges with the 32 schools that you're going to be focusing on because you might only be doing one school in my complex area. So, okay, let me um, 
the, first of all, the announcement of the schools we'll be making at the end of the week. We're still finalizing the list and kind of working on the agreement with DOE on how we're going to share that information, and I'll share all of that with you soon or in the next with by the end of the week. Um, the second thing is, in terms of the schools, a lot of schools are actually going to be experiencing space issues and are having more additional space with the, ch the um, change in kindergarten entry age. Since we will no longer have the JK program for some of those schools, that's opening up classrooms. So we have been meeting with principals and the CASs to figure out what where there is going to be space and what does that space look like. So we're in the process of doing that. In terms of DHS and the Preschool Open Doors program, it is a wonderful program, but there are some limitations. Um, one thing we found that in some communities, they really can't access the Preschool Open Door certificates. They really aren't able to, there aren't enough preschools in the community that children can access. And that was my concern. What just, are we being fair statewide if we just have the Preschool Open Doors model? Um, we found that in KKP on the Big Island, for example, that nobody was actually able to access those. So the CAS, Mary Correa, had this brilliant idea of operating preschool programs on her campuses, which actually was able to use the Preschool Open Doors funds in a way to be able to do that. So we're really modeling kind of some of the work that's already happened and building upon that. Thank you. Senator Takuda. Thank you. I just wanted to follow up on some of the, the questions, Gigi, since I know we've been talking about a couple of these multiple methods in terms of how we're going to address, first of all, the change in kindergarten age coming up in the 2014-15 school year and the 5,100 um, late-born children that will be impacted by this change. So I appreciate you explaining these um, three pathways that you're looking at. First, preschool open doors and the increase in subsidies. Uh, then FCILs for those communities where access to private or public options are very difficult, where either facilities are difficult or rural communities where even driving to a POD site is very difficult, um, or where families don't even trust going to a site, which we found in some of our zones of innovation from the leeward side um, to the Big Island. I know that's been a barrier. But um, focusing on the public preschool aspect, my understanding I w was that in trying to hone in on 32 or 33 sites or whatever that number was, one of the primary objectives was first trying to look for those places where private providers were not readily accessible. So there was not a private provider um, nearby for, uh, for our families to be able to have access, number one, but also where you had a number of different factors, willing principals, where you perhaps had some facility space available, um, but also um, a number of different things were taken into consideration that you were trying to see if you could try to get at least one per complex or complex area. Uh, was that not also some of the considerations taken into how you got those 32 to 33 sites? Yes, definitely. Thank you. Okay, because I think those are important considerations to take into play, that those were some important factors in coming up with those 33 particular locations um, and not clustering them in, in one particular geography over another, um, but also not forcing them onto campuses where you did not have space or willing principals, um, which was somewhat of an issue when we first started perhaps pre-plus with good intentions, but have had some difficulties in the past 10 years with the rollout. So um, I also wanted to go into this. I know when we did the $6 million in subsidies last year, it covered approximately 900 students, right? And we know that after we take out some of the federal um, and some of the Kiki Pahi scholars and some of the um, preschool sped and other things, we had about 3,600 kids that were in the gap there. So. If we were to increase 2.5 for subsidies, take a look at the preschool, public preschool options and FCILs, about how many children does that now leave us taking care of to some extent, knowing that it's not a free ride for every child, it's not a guarantee for every child, but of those late borns, how many are we kind of taking care of up to certain income levels for families? Because I think that's important. We were worried about those working families that are trying to make ends meet, as well as those within the 200% poverty range? It's about 2,240 when we add up all of the numbers from the children who will be eligible for preschool open doors, mm -hmm. those children who would participate in a DOE pre-K program, as well as those participating in the FCIL program. Okay, so are we starting to make some headway? Because my big concern has been 
you know, a lot of these different programs, whether it's federal or even some of the state programs within DHS, do heavily weigh into um, the 200 percent of poverty, which is good. We're, we're trying to increase access and get school readiness into those communities that do need it. But we have been creating another gap group of sorts with this, our working families that have a very difficult time of making ends meet. So are we starting to now, if we start to look at some of these additions, starting to make some inroads in assisting these working families that are finding it very difficult um, when it comes to another year of high quality preschool and, and, and school readiness options for their children if we look at these kinds of increases. Yes, and that's actually, and to get back to um, Representative Jordan's question, that's also one of the other positions that we're looking at is the policy analyst to really focus on data, to really make sure we're targeting all families, we're looking at the right children, or really connecting to as many people as we can, because that is one of our concerns, as in many states, is really how do we really count that make sure that no children are missing, that we're not kind of forgetting certain groups or not. So how do we make sure we're accountable for our actions and as transparent as possible? Thank you. Okay, Senator Zeeland. Thank you. Uh, Gigi, I just want to make sure I heard you correctly. Um, you mentioned something about the, the uh, the 32 schools that are being selected for this program are going to be announced soon or selected soon. So the program that you're talking about in the 32 schools, that's contingent upon this supplemental funding coming through or is that a separate? No, it's contingent upon the funding okay. coming through. So then I guess I want to get back to my question about whether this is premature. We're about to engage in a, a statewide conversation mm -hmm. about whether our constitution should be amended to allow tax revenue mm -hmm. to go to a public-private partnership in order to be able to fund a preschool program statewide. Under that model, you know, the understanding is going to be, uh, if people support it, that some of the voters who do support it are supporting it on the grounds that it's going to be a, a shared model, not a fully publicly funded preschool model. It sounds to me like what you're doing with announcing these 32 schools and this budget request is to begin the public portion of that preschool model. And I guess my, my concern is then we have initiated that and not yet had that conversation about whether there's support to go for it, nor have we had the conversation in the legislature about whether we would support a statewide preschool model. Um, so I'm, you know, when do you plan on announcing these schools and how do you plan on making this announcement given the fact that the legislature hasn't made any determination yet on the funding? Um, we are working with DOE on working on figuring out when that announcement will happen, um, but we know it is contingent upon your decisions. Um, in terms of thinking about the public-private partnership, however, I think with Preschool Open Doors, we do have that private partnership part of it. We also need to then kind of kick in how are we going to work with the public side of it. If the Constitution Amendment passes or not, we still need to really look at how can we better utilize our DOE campuses and teachers to really help with this population. I don't think it can be 100% in private preschools, nor can it be 100% in DOE public schools. It really does need to be a combination. So I see our office is being charged with right now really coming up with what does that look like. Since we're waiting on the Constitution Amendment, this kind of gives us that opportunity to really focus on that public part of the equation. What does that look like? How do we start? And that's also why we are starting kind of on the smaller scale. How do we start here to really see how does it work? How does, how best can we utilize our resources? Well, thank you for your answer, but I guess I don't see 32 schools as being a smaller scale. 